I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going home on the morning train. Evening train might be too late. Evening train might be too late. Evening train might be too late. Evening train. Evening train. Evening train might be too late. Back back train and get your load. Back back train and get your load. Back back train and get your load. Back back train. Back back train. Back back train and get your load. Get right church and let's go home. Get right church and let's go home. Get right church and let's go home. Get right church. Get right church, get right church and let's go home.
Good to see everyone out tonight. I'd like to welcome everybody out, and especially our visitors. They're always our honored guests here at Winfield. It's good to have everyone here. If you would, open your songbooks to number 578. We'll sing all four verses in the first song. <clears throat> Let us sing. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the we will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Lord, the hope of reigns in majesty, we will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness, we will worship Him. Let us sing. 
Our most holy, true, and living God, who are in heaven, 
Hallowed be thy holy name. We step on the throne of grace and mercy. And often finish of our pay. Lord, we come before you realize, Heavenly Father, that we're not worthy to talk direct unto thee, but we come through thee through Jesus Christ, who is worthy, who sits on the right hand of thee, and Father, one and only mediator between mankind and thee. And Heavenly Father, we just so thankful to be living in a land of free for we can or have the privilege of sending me here and wish it be in spirit and in truth. Magnify the holy name and lift up the name of Jesus and edify one another. And Heavenly Father, we pray that everything be done these for the Lord and accepted unto thee. And Heavenly Father, we pray for the man of our Brother Paul, who sits down before us to bring us the bread of life that we can feed our soul on and our hope for eternal life. Father, if to be that we are, please continue. To not hear here with knowledge and wisdom, so we can stand bold and preach that word that added to touch him. If in the season, out of the season. And if it be that holy will, please give him and his family a long life, if it be that holy will. And Heavenly Father, we pray that that word won't fall on their very well, that someone would come forward and say, Me and the brother, what must I do to be saved? And Heavenly Father, we pray if it be thy holy will, I'm merciful on all the sick and shed in throughout this land and country, especially though we have the whole of faith. Heavenly Father, I know we have so many amongst us that sick. Father, if it be thy will, I'm merciful on them and restore them back to a portion of thy holy hell, thy hell if it be thy holy will. And Heavenly Father, if we continue on through this service, be with us and Finish and guide us, and if it be that we have built us our faith more strongly, Father, that we can have more faith in you. And Father, be with us in this service. For all the best we pray through Jesus Christ's name, sake. Amen. Thank you. 
May I begin this evening by asking a question, a question that I believe is, a, well, an interesting question. I believe it's a question that uh, we're all concerned about, or at least we're, we're interested in. Do you believe that happiness is contagious? Uh, do, do you believe that uh, maybe uh, the people you're around or the places that you go uh, can just kind of create or, or instill within you to make you happier than maybe if you were around somebody else or in another place? So you, you, you think, I'm seeing a lot of heads nodding, you think uh, happiness is contagious, you know? Smile at an individual, I mean, just get, I mean, flash them, your big old pearly smile and everything. And what will most people do back? They will usually smile right back at you, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful? That's great. Uh, I, I'm convinced, though, as we think about this, that uh, as Christians, we have a particular uh, mindset. Uh, our mind is focused on certain things. And uh, we can walk through life. You know, the Bible talks about us walking through life, the, the Christian race and everything. And we can, we can go through life as a Christian. We can go just as, I mean, just as a uh, drab, just as a uh, forlorn, you know, uh, maybe as the next person. But, but then again, you know, you think about, you know, we're, we're in Christ. We have been forgiven of our sins uh, around the best people in the world, following the best book in the world, got the great God as our Father, and... You know, that kind of brings a smile to my face. That just lifts my spirit. That makes me feel good. Well, and if, if happiness is contagious, can't Christianity be that contagion that, that spreads that happiness among people? You begin to think about verses in the Bible and uh, things that are related to this. I just go through kind of a, a smattering of Scripture and think about what the Bible has to say. And think about Psalm 16 and verse number 11. If you've not, not gone there, Psalm 16, verse number 11, I, I encourage you to go there sometime. I was traveling, I, I was preaching a gospel meeting in Fort Payne. Fort Payne. And Fort Payne has the longest main street of any place I think I've ever been in in my life. I mean, it, you go forever down Main Street. Where are you at? Well, I'm on Main Street. Ten minutes later, you're still on Main Street. And I was passing the, the stores and everything, and they had one of those, you know, blinking light things. I don't know what you call them, but the, I call them the blinking light things and right out in front of the store, and, and all they had was Psalm 16 and verse number 11. I just grinned from ear to ear because I knew what that, that verse said, and as it, as it popped in my mind, joy in the presence of the Lord forevermore. Joy in the presence of the Lord. I love that. That is an absolute beautiful, beautiful passage. Go a little further in Psalm, Psalm 51 and verse number 12. And there we know that David, he is singing the Psalms, they're songs. And yet we read them, but, but he's singing this. And what he's thinking about, what he's got is the background is a tumultuous time. He had, he had sinned again and again and again, 2 Samuel chapter 11, and, and he cries out to the Lord. He, he restore unto me the joy of of your salvation. He knew, he knew he had done wrong and his, his spiritual life was in turmoil and he cried out, God, I want, I want the joy back. I want, I, want, I want it back. You go a little bit further, Matthew 25. Two times in Matthew 25, 21 and 23, same statement there, but, but remember the, the scene, the, the, the narrative, uh, the five, the two, and the one talented men, they've, well, in essence, said, put it to work. Five and two doubled. The one talented man hid his in the ground. He was condemned for that. He had all the blessings in the world. It wasn't a lot of blessings, but he had blessings, and, and he didn't do anything with them. And there in uh, Matthew 25 and 21 and 23, there the five and the two talented men are commended. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you faithful over many things. And then that statement, enter into the joy of your Lord. If, if, if happiness is contagious, then as we enter into the joy of our Lord, think about the people that we encounter 
from day to day. Luke 15, you know that, don't you? Luke 15. Four stories in Luke 15. I call Luke 15 God's lost and found department. That's what I call Luke 15. Because there's four stories about lost and found, lost and found, lost and found, lost and found. You begin with the sheep. One is lost and what does the shepherd do? He makes sure that the 90 and 9 are safe and secure and then what does he do about that one? Does he forget about it? He goes after it, doesn't he? You know, sometimes we've all been in that position of the one. Thank our Lord that he cares in a great way. Think about the ratio there. One in 100. One in 100. And yet there in verse number 6, once that one is found and brought back, there's great rejoicing. That's the first story, the lost sheep. The second story is the lost silver. Now the ratio is a little bit different because now you've got 10 pieces of jewelry or silver and one of them is lost and that lady turns the house upside down. Ladies, have you ever turned? I've turned the house upside down because I lose my keys on a regular basis. I'm consistent. If there's something about me that's consistent, I lose things consistently and I've got to turn the house upside down to find them and everything. And what do you do when you find them? Oh, <laughs> I mean, you rejoice. And she turned the house upside down and when she found that one, well, there in verse number nine, once again, rejoicing. But now the ratio. The first story, one in 100. The second story, one in 10. Third story, a father has two sons. One of them goes, you know the story, the prodigal, and he lives it up with daddy's money. And then the text says he comes home and, well, there in verse number 23, they come back and they, they rejoice or they make merry. They're, they're, they're excited because what was lost is now found and they're happy. Oh, oh they're happy. <laughs> you got three stories there. The lost sheep, the lost silver, the lost son. The fourth story is quite interesting because... Here's the sad guy. Here's the, here's the not so happy guy. Remember the elder brother? I was here the whole time. Why didn't you throw a party for me? He's gone, but now he's back, and all you're throwing a party for him. Down in verse number 32, why do you, why do you rejoice? Why are you making merry? And there's the story of the, the lost sibling. All of Luke 15 is teaching one lesson. The kingdom is coming. Be ready for the kingdom because what's lost will come into the kingdom. They'll be found. And don't act like the elder brother and get mad about it. I love John 16. Jesus there has been walking with his disciples through the city streets of Jerusalem. They've been in the upper room. They've observed the Passover feast. He's instituted the Lord's Supper. They have sung a hymn, and now they've come down from the upper room into the city streets, and they're walking through. He's teaching them the lesson. Back in the earlier chapter, John 15, there probably they walked along, and there is a vine, a grapevine, growing up a, a wall of a, a, of a house or maybe on a trellis or something like that. It's right there in the city, and he probably points it out, and he said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. And, and, and he teaches a very powerful lesson. By the time you get to chapter 16... Now, they're getting closer, closer to Gethsemane. They're, they're getting closer to the time that Judas would come and kiss him on the cheek. And he tells them there in verse number 33, in this world you'll have tribulation. In other words, be ready. It's not if, it's when. In this world you'll, you'll experience tribulation. But be of good cheer, he said. And you notice there on the screen, why were they to be of good cheer? I've got it. I've overcome the world. A series of passages in Acts, and, and then we'll get into the text, because I want to take you to, to the book of Philippians this evening and show you six markers, six markers in the book of Philippians that, that instill this, this joy principle, this, this excitement, this happiness about Christianity that can carry us above the mediocrity of the world. And we'll, we'll go through it quickly, but I wanted to preface it with these verses. Acts 5 and verse 41, the disciples, they had been censored, punished, 
they had been persecuted for the purpose of preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had suffered, but, but yet notice what, what happened. They, they counted it joy. That they considered it happiness because they were worthy to suffer for His name. You know, that's almost what, what you'd call an oxymoron. Suffer and experience joy because of it? But nonetheless, they understood the purpose in which they were living, and the purpose was to make the Lord known. And so as they made the Lord known, they experienced persecution. But the more persecution they experienced, the happier they got because they knew there was more being taught. You know Acts 8, 39. You know it. Oh, man, we know, we know that. We know that Philip and the eunuch, and Philip baptizes the eunuch, and Philip is caught away. But, but the eunuch, the, the text says there, what, what did he do? When he left that time and he, he was living his life, he was living as a Christian, how did he live as a Christian? He went on his way what? Boy, just, and I've told you this phrase before, and I believe it with all of my heart. I don't understand it. I don't know what it means, but I tell you, when I, when I say it, I, I've, I've got it. Because he was, like, he was happy as a dead pig in the sunshine. I mean, he was just rejoicing. <laughs> Think about the day, maybe the night, when your sins were washed away, oh happy day. It's interesting to study the historical aspects concerning this eunuch, this Ethiopian nobleman. Read about him sometime from a historical standpoint and see the great things that are recorded about what he did as a Christian. Acts 16, 25, I, I like that. Paul and Silas have been in prison. Remember, in the midst of the prison, it's midnight. There in that passage, oh, <laughs> what a wonderful, wonderful thing. Acts 16 there, midnight. What do they do? They sing praises. Uh, have you ever just been, just been going about your day and, and you just start singing? I mean, you know, a song gets in your mind and you, you just, it makes you happy. And I, I, I sing gospel songs that way. Two more passages. Hebrews 12 in verse number 2. Powerful passage. Now, in verse number 1 of Hebrews 12, we're told that we're to run with patience the race that is set before us. Get rid of any encumbrance, any, anything that would hold us back, any ball and chain that would encumber our, our running the Christian race. In other words, purge the sin from our life because it'll hold you back and hold you down. And, and then we're told in the first part of verse number 12, look unto Jesus. Keep him in focus. In other words, you see him down there at the end of the way. Keep your eye fixed on him so that you don't get looking about everything. And then we see an exemplification of his life. Who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And that's tough to understand, folks. The joy set before him, he endured the cross. That's, that's tough. I'm working on that one right there. Equally to that, James 1 and verse number 2. Now, this is the last one, then we'll go to Philippians. James 1 verse number 2. Now listen to this. There, James, he says, My brethren, consider it all joy, or count it all joy, when you fall into various trials. Now, folks, I'm working on that one. Be happy when, when the difficulties come. The next verse, in verse number 3, there, as we do that, uh, knowing this, that the testing of your faith will produce something, patience, endurance, perseverance. And then in verse number 4, as he says, but let patience, that endurance, have its complete or perfect work that you may be perfect and entire so that you're not lacking anything. Philippians. In the book of Philippians, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, in studying, I found six markers. that You, you would say six places to drive down a stake or... Or, drive, or, or set up a gauntlet that seems to contribute to this overall principle of keys for a happy life. You know, when I've been speaking in leadership conferences and they assign maybe how to have a happy life or how to be a happy leader or how to be, the, how to be a happy boss and everything, I tell you what, people flood into those lectures. 
I mean these over here on the logistics and you know how to how to have a how to have an enjoyable inventory. Not many people go to that, but how to be a happy leader, how to be a happy boss boy. They just come in, they just flood in, and because everybody's interested in that, aren't they? I want to know how to go around smiling instead of frowning. And Paul tells us, here's how you do it. Marker number one. Chapter one and verse number two, notice this. There in this wonderful passage, notice as he introduces this powerful epistle to these people that were... Now, let's get the context. In the city of Philippi, uh, that was a Roman military retirement community. Rome basically purchased that particular city and all of their military leaders that had served Rome, had, had been the, the great champions and everything, when they came to the end of their career, they wanted to go somewhere. So they said, we've got Philippi set off over here for you. You go and retire there, live out your days in, in just luxury. And so you have a lot of folks moving into that city that are just, I mean, stinking rich. I mean, just rich. But they're, they're not going to share with anybody. The indigenous population of Philippi, they're poor as a bag of rocks. And that's who Paul's writing to because that makes up the church. And notice what he begins with in chapter 1 and verse number 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing, receive grace and peace from Jesus. Receive grace and peace and peace from Jesus. Now this is a typical salutation when Paul is writing in these epistles and everything, but nonetheless in this particular epistle these folks needed this more than anything else in the world because their surroundings, their situation, their station in life was less than enjoyable. And yet he shows them a better way to it doesn't matter where you're at or your surroundings, take a look at the inner parts of your life and that will bring you the kind of joy that you, that you really need. Grace, God's unmerited favor, God gives us what we need. He gives it to us in abundance and peace. Oh, how we need that. So the first thing in regard to these keys to a happy life is receive grace and peace from Jesus, number two. In verses 3 down through verse number, really verse number 11, and I want to have a lengthy reading here, so stick with me and hang with me on this because what we have here are three principles that he really weaves together, kind of like faith, hope, and love, but he brings them together and he tells them, I've got you in my mind, I've got you in my prayers, and I've got you in my heart. In other words, when you hear somebody on the outside saying to you on the inside, I have got you as my focus, I believe that was something that would lift them up, especially if it was the Apostle Paul. Notice beginning in verse number 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. There's the mind. I've got you in my mind. Then he says in verse 4, Always in every prayer of mine, making request for you with joy. I've got you in my mind. I've got you in my prayers. Then verse 5. And for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being mindful or confident of this very thing, that he who began a great work with you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart. So there we've got the three things. So somebody come up to you and say, I've been thinking about you lately. I, I, I've just been, I've, I've had you in my mind. Well, thank you. And then somebody come up, you know, I, I've been praying for you here lately. Really? I appreciate that. Uh, or I've got you right here in my heart. I've got you at the center of my existence. Somebody say all three of those to you. What a wonderful gift to receive. And so he says there, I've got you in my heart inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense of the confidence, confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me in grace. Now notice verse number 8. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. I just want to be with you. 
you know, uh, we're fixing to have, you know, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. We'll be getting together. And the families are together today, and we'll have opportunity. Isn't it wonderful to get together? Get your family together. It's not often we can all get together. And boy, when we get together, we get loud, don't we? Man, we laugh and we cut up and oh, I mean, just, I mean, just have a barrel of monkeys and it's wonderful to be together. Paul is saying, that's what I want. I want to, I want to come and see you. That's what he wanted more than anything. Verse number 10, that you may approve of the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ being filled with the the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. My, what a relationship Paul had with his brothers and sisters in Christ that lived in the city of Philippi. It's the same kind of relationship we have in the Lord's church. I don't ever want to be on this planet without the relationship I have with my spiritual family. I feel as though I'm all of all people most blessed. You know, uh, today, Polly and I began six years. We've been with you five years now. Today, we begin year number six. And I can tell you this. The last five years have been some of the best years of our life. Now, that's nothing to say about where we've been and other congregations with which we've worked. We love them. But I can say to you, the last five years have been just fantastic. I, I can connect with Paul in the love he had for the Philippians. Isn't that better than, than saying, I tell you, the last, few, the last five years have been just... <laughs> Makes me sick to think about it. What would you think if that was said? <laughs> Bless their hearts, you know. Bless their hearts. But I tell you what, the time spent in the presence of the people of God, the only thing better is heaven. Number three. Okay, now we go and we flip on over to chapter 2. And verse number 5. Now you know that passage and you know it well. Philippians 2 and verse number 5. That's the let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now we know that Christ possessed that mind. But Christ is only one of the four examples in chapter 2 that possessed that mind. Now he's the greatest and so therefore he's mentioned first. But, but he's not the only one. Because as you go through that chapter you see not only Christ possessed the right kind of mind... Paul uses himself as an example. Epaphroditus is there and Timothy, all four of them. They had the kind of, the ideal mind, the idealistic mind that Paul is promoting. And there's the examples that he utilizes. But now, now to really get a hold of what kind of mind they're talking about, uh, Jerry, go back to verses uh, 2, 3, and 4. Now, if you want to know what kind of mind Christ had, that Paul had, that Timothy had, that Epaphroditus had, here it is. Three things that, that well, well, here's the mind that Paul was talking about. Notice in verse number 2. Fulfill ye my joy of being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Notice how many times the word one is used. One, one, one. He's talking about unity. Isn't it wonderful to be in unity, to be connected, to be in fellowship with God through Jesus Christ and all of God's people? When you have unity in the body of Christ, you will have a peaceful situation. And I tell you what, evangelism, edification, and benevolence will be at an all-time high when peace exists within the body of Christ. That's the mind of Christ. But now, notice in verse number 2, or rather verse number 3, the second thing. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Can you imagine? Can you imagine someone going about their day or, or their profession or their friendship or their relationships and they're motivated by selfish ambition and conceit? Why'd you do that? Well, I, I'm selfish and I'm trying to get ahead. I'm conceited. I'm, 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 I'm egocentric and... 
He said, don't let any of that ever be a part of you, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. When I look out at the people around me and I value them, and I, say, I see and I say how important they are and how wonderful they are, and that's the way I'm going to practice the golden rule because I want, I want to be treated... I want to be treated a certain way. So what do I do? I do unto others as I want them to do to me. What a marvelous relationship. The third one in verse number four, notice this. Let each of you look not out only on his own interest, but also on the interest of others. I've I, I got to take care of... You know what the Lord has placed within my care. I, I dare do nothing less. But I'm just not in this for me, myself, and I. What a blessing it is to be a part of the whole. Okay, quickly. Let's move on and notice a couple of others. Uh, Chapter 2, verse number 14. Now we get into a little bit of attitude here. And we understand that, you know, attitude is important, isn't it? We talk about a bad attitude or a good attitude. And, and here he's, he's warning against a bad attitude. Don't let this happen. It, it'll rob us of our joy. So what does he say there? Chapter 2 and verse number 14. He said, do all things without complaining and disputing. Imagine. If, if I lived my life and I didn't complain and no disputation, would that make me happier or would that make me miserable? Now, folks, I'll be honest with you, I'm working on this one. This one is one that I have to preach to myself in the mirror over and over and over and over. I tried to complain just the other day and couldn't find anybody to complain to, so I gave up on it. But, you know, and, and we've said and we've talked about over and over and over again, what do we really have to complain about? Don't we have enough and then some? I've been blessed to travel all over the world and to find some very poor places, third, fourth, fifth world countries and everything. And uh, every time I come back through either Atlanta or Chicago or something like that uh, and come through and pass through immigration into the good old United States of America, I always remember and say, oh, how blessed, how blessed I am. Quickly, notice two more. Go to chapter 4 and verse number 4. Notice in chapter 4 and verse number 4 here, we need to rejoice in our relationship with the Lord. Rejoice in our relationship with the Lord. In fact, he says there, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says, and again I say rejoice. Now, I've often wondered, why did he, he say it twice? It's very likely, and this is my conclusion, good things are worth repeating. Good things are worth repeating. I've said it all my life as a minister. A, a, a growing congregation has great things to announce. Man, I tell you what, we have been flooded with announcements here lately, haven't we? I, I looked at the number board, and, and numbers does not necessarily identify growth in, in every area because there's spiritual growth and there's, there's uh, uh, other kind of growth and that kind of thing. But folks, sometimes numbers, it does indicate indicate some sense of growth and everything. And folks, our numbers are going up and up and up and up. I'm proud we're going to have to expand. I'm proud. I'm so excited about that. Because great things are worth repeating. 
I want to challenge you to do something this week. Those people you love, that you appreciate, that you admire, that are important to you, don't just think about how much you love them or how you appreciate them or in your heart you're, you're really fond of them and they mean a lot to you. I want to challenge you. Tell them. You're, you're very likely already doing that. But just don't tell them once. Tell them twice. Isn't it wonderful when someone gives you a compliment? Yeah. Somebody said this morning, Mark, your hair looks pretty good. Boy, I tell you, I've grinned all afternoon. I said, I still got it. You know, it's a, it's, it's a little bit different color. And I, I, said, Ooh. I, said, I, I just said, I just grinned. I, I, that just really built me up, you know. And I, I said, well, I'm not going to let it end with me. Call three people. And I told them, you mean the world to me. You mean the world to me. The last one, okay. Uh, we go to chapter 4, verse number 19. I love this. Uh, you know, if you ever, ever come down to the end and you say, I'm going to end on a good note, Paul is going to end on a good note. Now, he's had a lot of good things to say. He's had some straightforward things to say. You know, there's sometimes when we need to just hear the truth even if it hurts, Right? And Paul, he told them the truth. Quit you complaining. Quit you murmuring. You know, and they needed to hear that. I need to hear those things that are straightforward. But he ends on a good note. Chapter 4, verse number 19. I love this. And my God shall supply... Now, when, when he's saying this, this is a, in, in a context. It's contextual. Because, you see, it's in this context where he's talked about... I've learned that wherever I'm at, whatever's going on in my life, I've learned to live that way and, and to be content. He said, that's where I can do all things through Christ because He's the source of my strength. And, and, and he sums it up there in verse 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. To me, Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 19 is a repeat of Matthew 6 and verse number 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. We close with this. After studying and continuing to study the epistle of Paul to the Philippians, I'm convinced that a person either lives in Philippians 1.21 or they live in Philippians 2.21. The people either live in Philippians 1.21. You know what that says. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Or they live in Philippians 2.21, which says, All seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. I want to live in Philippians 1.21. And I believe that that will bring the greatest amount of joy, happiness, to this thing called Christianity. And Christianity is full of ups, and it's full of downs, isn't it? There's mountaintop experiences and there's times we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But thank God, He says, I will be with you. This evening, if there's a need in your life, it could be a prayer request, maybe to know that others are praying for you, could be something that you need to, to get right with God. Could be that you need to become a Christian tonight. Start that journey of going on your way rejoicing. Whatever it is, we're blessed in such a wonderful way to know the Lord has our best interest at heart.
there's anyone here this evening that needs to, to do any of that, oh, what a wonderful setting situation this is to improve our lives as Christians. And if we can help you in any way, won't you come as together we stand and as we sing. There's a fountain Turn your song books to number 882. That'll be our closing song. Brother Braxton will lead our closing prayer. If you haven't had a chance to complete your worship by taking of the Lord's Supper, it's prepared in the room to your right in the back. You can go there at this time. Somebody will be there to wait on you. On the sick list, we have... You need to add, if it's not on your notes already, Gary Eads will be having a PET scan tomorrow. Moose Simmons is has some more heart tests coming up over the next couple of weeks, so keep him in your prayers. And Bill Webb was admitted into UAB with a blood clot in his leg, and they're, uh, they're doing some tests on him, I think, to find out what exactly is going on there. We did get a note. <coughs> says, uh, Dear Precious Church Family, Thank you so very much for the calls, texts, and concerns for our little darling Scarlett. Most of all, thank you for all your sweet prayers. We love you all, Cody, Sydney Mann, Theron and Kim Lee, and Nana. Remember that Group 3 meets tonight over here to sign cards. Remember our fall festival. We've been announcing that for a few weeks now, but that will be next this coming Wednesday night at Darrell and Marsh's. If you can't go to that, we will be having a Bible study here at the building at the same at 6:30 next Wednesday night as usual. Friends and family today be on October the 29th. That's at Twin Park, and Josh Posey will be speaking here at the building for our morning service. He'll speak at the park for our evening service. Uh, those who want to help cook with that need to meet Ben and Jerry down here in the front of the building next Sunday morning after services. And and this is Friends and Family Day, y'all, so invite people. You don't, We don't have to just keep it to ourselves. Last year we had a pretty good crowd show up, but we all got out and invited people. We had people coming that some of us hadn't seen in years. So if you see somebody you want to invite, invite them. Let them know we're going to have some good food and uh, get as many people there as we can. And remember to tell them to bring their kids because they'll get some good treats. Uh, last but not least, 
Don't forget to turn in your updated directory information and your service list. This is important, and we still have some people who haven't done that. So if you're one of those people who are lagging behind, get one of those forms and fill it out and get it turned in so we can get that finished up. Has anybody got anything else? Ben? Number 882 was saying the first verse. If you would, you stand, and after that, Brother Braxton, say the closing prayer. No fears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory. with me please Heavenly Father we thank you for so many of the blessings that you've given and bestowed upon us we ask you to be with those that are sick those that are having tests this coming week and especially those that are mourning loss we pray tonight for those that have lost their way that they may come back to you as Christians we ask for those that haven't made that decision yet that they 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 weigh heavy on them and make that decision as they should. We pray tonight that the events that are going overseas, that there's means and ways that they come to a peace and those people can get back to their normal works of life. We ask you tonight as we leave here that you give us the strength, the knowledge, the means, and the ways to Fight off the evils that come knocking at our doors, at our family's doors, and our fam and our friends' doors. Give us the capability to gain the means that we need to continue to contribute to this congregation, this community. Forgive us of those where we've wronged you. We ask all this in your son's Jesus' name. Amen.